Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, I'm welcoming Rob Dunn. He is a professor in the Department of Applied Ecology at North Carolina State University and in the Natural History Museum of Denmark at the University of Copenhagen. Today, we're discussing his book, Never Home Alone. Rob, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Um, So can you just tell us a little bit? um, Your book is called Never Home Alone. Can you tell us what inspired you to put this together? Well, so, so I started off as a rainforest biologist and sort of uh, trying to understand life's general rules and, and jungles around the world. And eventually, as I moved to North Carolina State University in Raleigh, I started to notice more and more that there were, there were big discoveries to make in backyards and cities. And eventually, I realized that there are also these kinds of discoveries to make in people's homes. And so my whole lab and our research program started to drift toward trying to understand what's in kitchens and bedrooms and, and sinks and, and doing that with the public. And, and so at some point in that work, it became clear that we, we'd figured out enough new things about our daily life that, that it was time to write a book about it and share that story. Well, you know, I, I, I found your book fascinating. I'm, I've this year been um, fascinated with the information about, um, you know, our microbiomes and the earth. So I did a show, a few shows on gardens and, and you know, why it's important not to use pesticides. And um, so when I found your book, I thought it was great because you've done a lot of research that people haven't done. You're trying to understand what's in our daily life, which we don't, we, it seems like we don't know a lot about this yet. You, you've discovered a lot of new things. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, we, we studied this um, our daily at the very beginning of Western science. Uh, we studied a lot about daily life, and so like the first depictions of bacteria, of of fungi, of protists, they're all from in people's houses. Um, but eventually, once we figured out that there was a tiny subset of species that could do us harm, most of the focus on houses and water and and our bodies really shifted to thinking about those bad species. And we lost something of the wonder we used to have for the rest of that life, and and people sort of abandoned it. And so people like me, who are basic ecologists who study, you know, the rules of life, we went off to the Galapagos or we went to, you know, mountains or deep-sea vents, and and it left nobody just to to document our, our houses. And so it, every time we do some new study in houses, we find some totally new thing living right in our midst that, that nobody would noticed before. So it's been super fun. Um, well, it, I, I found a lot of it fascinating. I would I, I spent all week reading it, and I'd come to work and be like, I read in, in Rob's book this this interesting <laughs> study. So, it, you know, and I, I mean, I'm sure they were all kind of rolling their eyes because I get excited every week about my shows. But um, I, I find it fascinating because of our, our history with bacteria and how afraid we are of it. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about what's happened over time and, and you know, kind of what our understanding is like now. Yes. Yeah, so, so what, um, you know, we discovered uh, that bacteria could do us harm relatively recently, and and we did so in the context of, you know, times when when millions of people were were dying from relatively easy to control uh, pathogens like cholera, um, and so once we started to figure out that some of these things were dangerous. Uh, I think it just shift, started to shift our mindset toward imagining that, well, we'd be better off if we got rid of all of that invisible stuff. And so if you look at drawings of microbes before we understood that any of them were pathogens, they're, they're filled with wonder. They all kind of look like little stuffed animals, and there's this just, you know, hope, hope, hopeful vision of them. And then if you look after we figured out that some of them could kill us, they all look like the worst demons and monsters you could ever imagine. And then... Through time, I think that only got more and more extreme, uh, so that we now have this view that if we can't see it, it's probably bad, so let's scrub everything. Um, and then, but in the last 10 or 15 years, we've started to realize that a lot of these species are beneficial or even necessary for daily life. Um, 
and that the proportion of those species that are harmful is teeny tiny. And so we don't know how many bacteria species there are on Earth. Some people think a couple million. Some people actually think trillions. But there are fewer than 50 uh, that are regular pathogens. And so that means the, the, almost all the things you're bumping into, breathing in, are either har- harmless or actually beneficial. And, and that, that's going to require us to make a real change in how we think about life to, to get a handle on that. But I think we need to. Well, I, I, you know, that's a really important numbers to put together, trillions of bacteria and maybe only 50 harm us, um, you know, and we're, we're living in fear. People don't want to touch things and we're afraid to get, you know, a cold or flu and, and we scrub things clean with these harsh chemicals. And we don't even, from especially from what I gather from your book and doing other shows like this, that, that we don't understand the damage that we're doing by trying to to be so clean. No, that's right. And I mean, I think the, um, one of my colleagues, uh, Jenna Lang, did a study where she studied the International Space Station and its microbes. And uh, t- to me, it's actually a really interesting uh, case study because it's kind of like, well, if you really scrub everything and you keep the windows closed all the time, what are you going to live with? And, and the lesson is that like, the International Space Station basically looks like a bathroom or like it looks like somebody kind of dissolved. It's all skin and body microbes. Um, and so when we really, really scrub you know, and seal everything up, that's what we kind of end up living with, is just our own falling apart. Um, and then if we keep scrubbing and overusing antibiotics, we just favor the subset of those species that are really harmful. And so you know, the, all the products you can buy, they always say it kills 99% of germs. That's like the worst percentage to kill because what's the one percent? That's the, the most terrible worst ones. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, I, I think that uh, we've been thinking about it all wrong. And at the same time, we know that some of the things we do are super, super useful. So if you wash your hands with soap and water, that saves millions of lives every year. Incredibly useful. Um, preventing pathogens from being in our water supply saves tens, hundreds of millions of lives a year. And so there's some of these things that we do that keep that 50 species at bay that we need to keep doing. But then some of these other things where we're just sort of blindly wandering through our house trying to kill everything, not so good. Well, um, so you did a, a study of, of people's homes. And um, what did you find when you were doing that? So, so we had people swab. We gave people these swabs that looked like Q-tips, and they would swab dust in their houses. And there are now new methods available, um, new genetic methods that allow us to decode which DNA is in that dust without even have, having to grow the microbes. And so it gives us a picture, um, sort of a, a DNA-based picture of what's in your homes. And so we can see the bacteria, the fungi, the, even the plant uh, DNA, the animal DNA, all from those swabs. Um, and when we did that, we found upwards of 200,000 um, life forms, 200,000 species living in people's houses. And so, you know, it's just in, this incredible wilderness of life. And what always strikes me is that, you know, if you breathe in right now, Rebecca, just breathe in deeply, there are probably a thousand species in that air you're breathing in. And most of those, no one has ever, ever studied. And so we don't know, their, we haven't named them, we don't know what they do. And, and so it's this kind of amazing wilderness we, we stumble through. Well, I thought that was the amazing part. I mean, nobody had studied these. So, so what what is happening around us? We don't even know the role that that these bacteria are playing, and then we're trying to go and kill them all. And um, I'm I'm you know I'm sure you're along this line suspicious that this is like our gut bacteria, where when we kill all the good stuff, we're going to get that overgrowth of the bad stuff. Just like you said, you know, if you kill 99%, what's left is the stuff that doesn't get killed. That's you know, going to cause harm. And uh, it seems like we actually are supposed to be living in a balance with all these bugs. Yeah, re- really well put, much better put than I, than I could have done. Um, I, th- I, th- I think that's a great summary that, you know, we've, we built these new kinds of houses and we've favored a bunch of species we don't know very much about. And so we have weird habitats like salt shakers that have new things in them. But, but, but then we're also trying to disfavor things all the time. And, and as you point out, and thinking about the human microbiome, it's increasingly clear that when we try to, to kill everything on our bodies, it causes all kinds of problems for us um, that we're just starting to get a handle on. And I, I think the simple message for our homes is that, that 
that's almost certainly the most likely scenario of what's happening in our houses. If we get rid of all of the things we used to be exposed to or we try to, we get the worst stuff around us, and then we fail to get the stuff we need. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, it's a, we, we need a new awakening. Mm-hmm. Well, there's one study that you talked about um, taking um, the dust from the homes of, of the Amish and the Hutterites. Can you just talk about what, what that study was about? Yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a growing sense um, that, that when we clean our houses so much that we start to fail to get exposed to microbes that we need for our immune systems to work well. And so that this is in some way or another associated with asthma and um, allergies and a whole suite of autoimmune problems. But it's been really hard to study. Uh, and, and, but one of the really interesting recent studies compared Amish and Hutterite populations with very similar German genetic backgrounds. In many ways, these are very similar lifestyles, agricultural lifestyles, um, somewhat isolated from other populations. But we know that the, um, the Amish have very low rates of allergy and asthma, and the Hutterites have very high rates of allergy and asthma. And, and so the question became, are the Hutterites being exposed to something different than the Amish, and is that triggering their asthma? And so there was a, a group at the University of Chicago and um, other institutions, included Jack Gilbert and others, and what they did was that they first compared the immune systems of the Hutterites and the, and the Amish, and they could show that, the, it, indeed, the Hutterites were, were failing, to, their immune systems weren't responding to normal stimuli in the way you would hope, that they were sort of overreactive to things around them. And then they were also able to show that the microbes and the dust in the Hutterite homes were different. And what they argued was that Whereas the Amish uh, have traditional farms that are non-industrialized, that are right near their houses, and they have a lot of direct exposure to animals, that the Hutterites are more like sort of Western culture more generally, that their farms are far away and they're industrialized, and so those farm microbes aren't making it into the house. And so that was interesting in and of itself, but it was all observational. But what they then did was to take the dust from Hutterite homes and from Amish homes and expose uh, allergic asthmatic mice to it. And when the mice were exposed to the Hutterite home dust, their allergy systems, uh, symptoms got worse. When they were exposed to the Amish dust, which seems to have more kinds of microbes, more farm microbes, more animal microbes, um, some of their allergy and asthma symptoms actually went away. And, and so this suggests that there's this really important exposure to wild biodiversity in our homes that we have to get for our immune systems to function normally. It also means it's really tricky to figure out which part of it is it, you know, which species do we need. But as you pointed out earlier, it may be that in many cases the simplest answer is to do simple things like keep our windows open, keep your fingers enmeshed in the soil, grow a garden, um, yeah, sort of reconnect your life to to the wildness around you. Well, you know, you know, there's a lot of talk about how gardening is very relaxing, and it makes me wonder if if that's one of the reasons why. Um, because you know, you're. I mean, not only are you connecting to the earth, but we don't quite know why that's so important for us. But you're, you're getting your you're getting dirty, and you're being exposed to all these things that we probably really need. We're probably very deficient in certain bacteria, and we have no idea because we haven't studied it until you've come along. Yeah, and I think that the take home would be getting dirty seems good for a bunch of different reasons, um, and we don't totally all understand all of them yet. But getting dirty seems to have very few negative effects, so go ahead and get dirty. <laughs> that, that's a, a good time to end for a break, so everybody um, get dirty in the next two minutes. I'm talking today with uh, Rob Dunn, and we're discussing his book, Never Home Alone, and we'll be back shortly. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. Healthcare has been a major part of news stories today, with one thing that has been consistent 
inconsistency. Both healthcare providers and patients have to work around and get used to a constantly changing set of rules and issues. Nurses have historically been left out of this decision making. Listen to Once a Nurse, Always a Nurse, exploring the world of nursing with host Leanne Meyer. Health professionals, we invite you to share your ideas and experiences while listening to experts in various areas of nursing. Listen Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on Voice America Health and Wellness. Everything is energy. It's all connected. Your energy can be seen as the foundation for your life and impacts all areas of living. Do you realize that your thoughts have the power to affect how you show up? Tune in for Healthy Energy with Margo, featuring host Margo Nielsen. Margo and her guests will show you that connecting to your energy is vital to your health, relationships, money, and more. Listen live every Monday at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Now you don't have to stay linked to your desktop or laptop. Take Voice America on the go and listen anywhere. Get our mobile app for iPhone, BlackBerry, or Android at the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Rob Dunn, and we're discussing his book, Never Home Alone. So, Rob, we got into the conversation about the bacteria that you're you're finding in people's homes. And um, I brought this up in another show, but I recently um, got this machine that actually sprays bacteria back into the environment to try to balance out, um, because I have animals, so I thought it would help balance out the, you know, what they bring in. Um, Is this something that, that you've heard about as well? So, so, so walk me through a little, little bit more, Rebecca. What the machine is doing? It's it's got a source of bacteria and it's spraying them, or how does it work? Yeah, yeah. It goes off every fifteen minutes for I think thirty seconds or a minute, and it just puts bacteria back into the environment to help balance um, it out. So, yeah. So I don't know that one. I mean, there are, there are a bunch of people starting to work on um, on things like this. Uh, the trick is, and I think the fecal transplants are a good analogy here. The, the trick is. We don't necessarily know exactly which species we want to have around. Um, and so figuring out how to sort of, I mean, I think we would love to move toward being able to garden the species that we most need in our houses or spray them around. Um, but, but the trick is out of those 200,000 species or so, which ones do you really want? And so the, there are a number that we know are not harmful and are probably fine um, and might be beneficial. And so far, the examples I know of, um, which aren't, uh, they aren't machines, but uh, some sprays that people can use around their houses sort of fall into that category. Uh, definitely benign, probably maybe beneficial. We're not super sure yet. But I think okay. the fecal transplant is, is uh, interesting here. Have you talked about fecal transplants on the show before? Um, no, no. I, I, if it came up, it was brief because I, I don't remember. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it's an interesting topic because um, you know people who are suffering from very serious um, um, issues, you know, they basically get bacteria put back into their guts and and then they're they're healed, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, it it, it is super amazing, and they and they can't for some uh, problems are really effective, but I think. They're also kind of a lesson because what we're doing is, in those cases, not taking individual bacteria species, but but uh, the whole community of bacteria from a healthy person and giving them to a sick person. And and so I think it's it's a good measure of the sort of uh, uh, the humbleness of what we know at this point um, about the life around us. That we don't quite know which ones of these are most beneficial. Uh, we know that we seem to be often be losing the ones we need, but at the moment, the best thing we can do for guts is to do a just a transplant of what seems healthy into what's not. And that, I think, you know, in the houses, we're, we're probably going to see something similar. That the best effects are from um, not losing the microbes that we want around us in the first place, uh, and then it's going to be trickier to add back the ones we most need. 
Well, and and from the study you did on people's homes, you said everybody's different. I mean, you found 200,000 new species, you said, but I I can't imagine those were all in the same home. Um, From what what I remember in your book, um, it it was different in different areas and people had different different bacteria. Yeah, that's that's right. So for for um, for fungi, the you know, we can actually tell where your, where dust came from based on which fungi are in the dust. And so the fungi are really different for different regions. Um, the bacteria, on the other hand, seem to be really different depending on how people live. And so what kind of uh, AC or heating you have, do you have a dog or do you not have a dog? Those things all have huge impacts on which species are in your house. And so um, at least for the foreseeable future, it's there's probably a much bigger effect of opening the window or having or not having a dog relative to any specific microbe that you might be spraying into your house. So um, what kind of effect do those things have on us? Um, Well, so having a dog uh, brings in a bunch of species we don't otherwise see. Uh, And so we can actually tell if you have a dog just based on the dust uh, in your house. And so if we identify the bacteria species in your dust, we can tell you, do you have a dog? Now, that's, not, that's an expensive party trick that nobody wants because you already know <laughs> if you have a dog. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's an indicator that they really have a big effect on which species are there. And uh, it's still a little early, but it looks to me like um, when we look at studies of rural environments, that there don't seem to be a ton of health benefits of having a dog. Um, there's psychological benefits, but not on immune health, uh, not on allergy or asthma. But if you look at studies of cities, people seem to have health benefits of, of having a dog. Allergy rates go down, asthma goes down, especially if the dog's there when uh, a, a baby is in utero. So that baby, when it's born, has a much reduced risk. And so the question then becomes, what's happening? And I, I think part of what may be happening is that when you really seal up your home and you don't open the windows and... Uh, you know, you're on your third floor of an apartment building and you scrub everything all the time, that that dog becomes your sort of last connection to outdoors. And so the few environmental microbes that the dog is bringing in on its feet are actually enough to have some impact on your risk of allergy and asthma. And we don't know that yet, but I think it's, it's in line with the observations we're starting to, to make, um, well, which is, is crazy. But, yeah. Yeah, well, it is interesting because we've seen a rise of, of asthma and allergies and, and eczema. Um, and uh, I, there is a lot of theories of why, but, uh, you know, I tend towards the one of where, you know, we're, we're too clean and we're too toxic. You know, we're spraying our, our, um, our gardens with pesticides and we're, you know, taking antibiotics and we're killing all these bugs in our environment. We're using, you know, cleaners in our homes and we've got nothing to help keep those balances, which um, from what you're saying, these bugs are integral to our immune system. Yeah. And I think toxic is a good word there in the sense that, um, you know, we tend to imagine things being toxic to our bodies, but they can also be toxic to the species we depend on. Um, and, and so, you know, when we're overusing some of these uh, antimicrobials and antibiotics, we have, we have pretty sweeping effects on, on our health. And so, you know, to, to me, it seems very likely in 10 years that when we look at a lot of skin-related autoimmune uh, problems, um, like, like eczema, like rosacea, that we'll see that one of the reasons that those are becoming so much more common is that we're changing which skin microbes people have. Um, and that's triggering a whole suite of problems we didn't anticipate. And, and uh, it will always be, to go back to that fecal transplant case, easier to, to make sure people are getting good microbes in the first place than it will be to restore them once we screw them up. And I think that's a, a big lesson from how we think about houses in the context of nature more generally. We're not smart enough to rebuild nature once we screw nature up. We can build a crappy version of nature, which we tend to do over and over again. But it's way easier not to mess things up in the first place. Well, you know, it, it, it's been there in a balance for a long time. And then in the last you know, few hundred years, we've gone, oh, bacteria is bad <laughs> once we figured it out. And, and there, there is a certain part of it, like you said, washing your hands. And I know, um, you know, anytime I read a book on bacteria, they always talk about when they discovered washing your hands when you go from a cadaver to delivering a baby. And that saved a bunch of babies' lives. Um, 
And, you know, we do know that there are some things that we should do, but I think that we take things to extreme a lot of the time, you know, well, it's good for me to wash my hands when I go to the washroom, so I should wash my hands 10 times a day, just in general, when I touch things. Yeah, and I mean, I think one one way to think about it, too, is that we've now studied more than a thousand houses around the world, and we've never sampled a room in a house that, that wasn't full of life. And and so and the space station's full of life and the you know hot hot water heaters are full of life your freezer is full of life and and so I I think that we need to think not about like how do we get rid of everything but given that there's going to be life which life do we want? Hmm. Yeah, and and I prefer to have the ones that help me my immune system and help me live in balance and you know keep the bad ones in check. That's, I think that seems better to me. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> um, yeah, which I think anybody listening to the show will will now agree with that as well because it, it it's it's a. I think going to take us time to to switch our minds over. I mean, we all know um, that when you go to a hospital, you actually have a higher chance of of getting some super bugs, which is really interesting. And um, um, you know, it, w- we seem to still want to make our our homes and our offices in that same category that clean. You know, using those chemicals, and and it it, it just doesn't seem. It seems like we're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, I mean, I think what, one interesting example there is that, um, so we have these apocrine glands that are in our armpits, they're in our genital region, um, in our belly buttons, and the only thing those glands do is to feed microbes. And we've not yet figured out why they feed microbes, but but that's what, when, you, when your armpits stink, um, that's because your body has fed those microbes, and that's the the sort of sign of that metabolism. When they feed the microbes, the microbes then burp that smell. And so we have a whole set of glands um, that our body actively gives food to to feed these microbes that natural selection favored for some reason, and we don't quite know why yet. And, and so the first point there is it seems like we should figure out why. Um, but the other thing is, at the same time, we, we've designed all of these products to actively kill those bacteria that our body is trying to favor. And, and so, you know, we, we make these kinds of decisions all the time. And, in fact, uh, a lot of the underwear that you can buy now have antimicrobials in them. And so, on the one hand, you have these glands that are feeding microbes. and the other ha- hand, you have these, um, you know, the underpants that are trying to kill them. And uh, so, you're kind of at war with yourself. And, uh, and the consequences don't seem like they're likely to be good. It, it, no, it it doesn't, especially when you say that there, there's a reason for those to be in, in those areas. I mean, nobody really wants to walk around smelling, but um, to understand why that, well, I guess we need to understand why that's there um, so that, that we can um, culture that a little differently. And, and um, um, you know, it's probably because we're trying to kill those and trying to kill the smell, um, we're probably hurting ourselves in a ways that we don't understand. Yes, we, we, did a, we did a study where we compared people uh, before and after they used antiperspirant, and we could show that after using antiperspirant, that, that bacteria that your armpits usually favor goes away or becomes much rarer. And what becomes common are species that are related to pathogens in your armpits. Um, now, that might not ever make you sick, right? But it mm-hmm. doesn't seem like a great idea, uh, no, because it, 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 until we understand what's going on completely as well, it's really interesting. Um, you know, I... I, I just love when when there's more that we don't know that we we there's still stuff we have to discover you know to know that there's um, this whole world out there that we just don't understand um, and when we do understand it I think we're gonna have um, uh, be more comfortable with our environment as well I think a lot of people are afraid right now but um, uh, you must be excited about all of this for sure I, yeah I mean it's it's a um Sort of as two pieces. Like as a scientist, I'm super excited. As a parent and as somebody who lives in a house, it's at the same time kind of frustrating that we don't yet understand more. And mm-hmm. and so, um, you know, the science side of me, it's like every day we can go into like somebody's house under their bed and find new species and new phenomena, um, and it's fantastic. But at the same time, 
uh, I know that lots of people are suffering in terms of health and well-being, and that some of that has to do with which species we favored and not favored. Um, and so on that side, it's really frustrating that we're still so ignorant. Um, but but uh, our light is still humble, and the universe is pretty big. I, I definitely agree. I think as you do more, if you've discovered um, thousands of new bacteria species that we're all living with, uh, I think there's more to come for sure. Um, what what is the effect on on children in um, what you know that has happened with all of this? Um, you, you mean of the changes we've yeah, made in houses? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, the so the there's some good Finnish studies now that compare um, so the border between Finland and uh, Russia and the Karelian region. Um, you have more or less the same people on both sides of the border, and they were separated after the war. Um, and so they've had very different fates, similar genetic backgrounds, similar overall environment. And on the Finnish side, um, the Finns have very much moved in this w- way that Western cultures moved in general. It's in much cleaner houses, lives that are much more indoors. Um, and and what's, what's happened with Finnish kids over the last, uh, especially 20 or 30 years, is that allergy, asthma, and autoimmune disorders have become uh, each year more common versus on the Russian side where there's been bas- basically no change since 1945. Um, and, and so I, I think that's a microcosm of what we're seeing more generally. We're seeing a whole suite of new chronic problems in our kids um, that depend complexly on what the, our kids are being exposed to in ways that are going to be hard to understand and yet clearly seem to have something to do with the changes in what we encounter every day. And I think the other thing to keep in mind with kids is that the average kid now spends 23 to 23 and a half hours out of the 24 hours in the day, indoors, either in a car or in a house or in a school. And, and so the other thing for me is that we, we basically no longer have any other exposure to biodiversity other than the species that are living with us. And so whatever changes we make indoors, those are the most direct changes on the well-being of our kids. Um, which we know, you know, if it doesn't, um, if we, yeah, we know, we've discussed what, what's happening. Um, so I find I find this um, really interesting that we're seeing these changes, and and I, I love that you're you're doing this. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Rob Dunn, and we're discussing his book Never Home Alone. We'll be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. Are you tired of the healthcare system only treating your symptoms and never addressing the root cause? Discover how integrative medicine can resolve health issues through dietary and lifestyle changes and the use of natural supplements. Increase your energy, memory, mood, immune system, sexuality, and more. Join Dr. Sunil Pai and Maureen Sutton to help you take back your health with natural, evidence-based solutions. Tune in every Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific Time and 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Voice America Health & Wellness Channel. Addiction can affect our relationships, our families, our home, and work lives, but most importantly, ourselves. The recovery process can do wonders in the lives of people suffering from active addiction and also for those that love them. It's not just 12-step programs, but so much more. It's learning how to live life on life's terms. If you can relate to these issues or love someone who does, start with yourself. Start by tuning in to Miracles in Recovery with host Ray Lynch, Mondays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Hope is in your corner. Have you become a member yet? Sign up now to become a member of Voice America. It's always free and easy. Plus, you get to take advantage of some great member benefits. Get unlimited access to millions of hours of on-demand content across all of our channels. Keep track of your favorite episodes, shows, and hosts in your own customizable library. Find out what shows you might be interested in based on your favorites. Plus, you get insider access with our newsletter. Membership gives you more. Sign up at voiceamerica.com and click register at the top right. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness.
You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Rob Dunn, and we're discussing his book, Never Home Alone. So, Rob, is there a way that all these bugs um, that you're finding benefit us that we don't quite understand yet? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, they're thinking about insects, for example, or, or arthropods like spiders. I mean, you know, some of the benefit comes from just what they do in the house. And so, you know, some of the microbes in your house are helping to compete with pathogens. Some of the spiders in your house are helping to eat some insects that we don't want in homes. Um, but the other kind of value they can have is that they, as we study them, we can learn ways to use them in some other uh, form. And so, for example, a number of years ago, we found uh, a giant Asian camel cricket species that had moved house to house across North America. Do, do you happen to have these? Do you, do you know them, Rebecca? These. No. They're kind of blind crickets with long antennae. No, um, but it's pretty cold where I am in Canada, so <laughs> I've never seen them. They can still lurk in a slightly warm cellar, but um, actually I'll have to look at how far north they go. But so, so we didn't even know they were in houses in, in North America. We knew they were in greenhouses. And now we estimate there are tens of millions of them. And so once that study uh, came out, I thought people were going to be so excited, like, oh, it's this new camel cricket. We didn't notice it before. It's beautiful. It has long antennae. But the, the most common response was, well, what good is it? And as, as a, an ecologist, that's a question I'm not really trained to think about so much. You know, well, well I just think they're interesting. You just got excited because you found them. <laughs> yeah, I got excited because we found them. Nobody studied them very much. Like, they're, they're just kind of cool and intriguing. But so we started to think, well, what good could they be if we asked that question to ourselves? And we know that they're ancestrally, they're, they're cave crickets. And so they live in, you know, dark environments without much in the way of food resources. What if in those environments that they have adaptations to eat food that's really hard to break down, uh, like little bits of carbon, of wood even, that uh, can't be degraded easily? And, and so then I teamed up with a colleague, Amy Grendon, to see if, well, maybe we could find in the camel cricket actually microbes that can do that. And maybe we could use them in some way to break down some of the industrial waste that we have so many problems with. Um, and so Amy had been working on this stuff called black liquor, which is when you make paper, it's what's left over. Um, and it's, it's like the hard part of wood. It's lignin in an alkaline bath. And when you burn it, that's the smell of the paper pulp industry that um, uh, one can certainly find in parts of Canada as well as here. Um, And so we tried to figure out, could we find some microbes from the camel crickets that could break it down? And what I didn't know is that at the time is that there are only four species of bacteria on earth that can actually break down the lignin. And so it was a super unlikely uh, scenario that we would have luck. But uh, long story short, we did. We actually found four species that could break down that lignin, and one of them could do it in that alkaline bath. And so it shows hopes of being able to turn the waste from the paper pulp industry into energy. And and so we'll see where that goes, but to me that was a real lesson. It was that, well, until we start to look at what use these species around us every day have, we're never going to know what what it could be. And if we don't know their names, if we don't know they're there, you know, there's no way to even look. And so for me... That was really hopeful in a sense because it meant that, you know, kids growing up today, they could find species in their own home that could change society. And if our first one was something that could turn some kind of waste into energy, what, what could we have in 10 years from someone's basement or, or under the pillow or who knows where from, from your house, Rebecca? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the, it, I, I think there's a lot of possibility here. I'm just envisioning right now, um, you know, a future where somebody um, comes to your home and, and tests the bacteria environment and tells you where you're deficient, just like we would with our vitamins or something, and says, oh, you need to get this balance here because you don't have this and, and this is going to cause you immune issues or you have this one, so you need to balance that out. Like I, I just, I, I was going down this train of what would happen in the future when you've you know, we've got more studies on this, and I find it um, very hopeful. 
Yeah, I do, I do too. And I mean, I think that, you know, the way you presented it, it's kind of like a garden. And so someone can go to your house yeah. and tell you that your garden's not growing well. And then help you yeah. figure out how, how do you better grow that garden so it helps to sustain you and your family. And um, I, I think that that's a, a hopeful road. Yeah, and it definitely when when you you gave this um, in your book, you talked about when people are in cities, especially in an apartment building where you're high up, and the bacteria has to get there, so it usually doesn't. So it's just the bacteria from you that you're dealing with, and so of course you're probably going to be deficient in in those scenarios of the things that you need. Because if we look at that Amish Hutterite study, you know it it was the um, the the ones that had more. Um, uh, uh, close proximity to to the farm and and the bacteria from there that were doing better so of course we need the nature and if you're say 20 stories up in an apartment building or or even less but you're not going to get that bacteria blowing in because you're too high up yeah that's right and so we need to find new ways to connect new ways to garden we need to also get outside obviously um mm-hmm. but but I, I think that uh it's not something we've built into our future plans very well yet. You know, if you think about, like, how do we, what's the future look like in, in uh, sci-fi programs? And, and often it, you don't even see trees or, or non-human life. It's, it's all technological. But the truth is we're still biological beings. We, we can't live, uh, you know, extracted and isolated from nature. We need that nature. And so I think we need to... Um, do some exciting work in the next years, reimagining our future as one that is reconnected to the world around us. Mm-hmm. Well, we I think we've forgotten that on a lot of the time, and I there's a lot of healing with reconnecting, and this could be part of the reason why. I think I think there's other reasons, but um, you know, if you're um, you, you know, I deal with people that are chronically ill, as an example, and they have difficulty leaving their homes, and I you know I tell them just take your car and go to the park and sit on a bench if you can't go for a walk because you need to be outside, and if you're sick and you're inside, and let's say your environment is deficient and a bacteria your immune system needs or has too much, say, fungi in it, um, mold is an issue, um, you know, you're not going to get better. You're going to be stuck in that little tiny um, isolated area and not have the exposure that you need. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. So one other thing you talked about in your book was uh, fermented food. So what does that have to do with all of this? Well, so, so as I was writing the book, I was trying to find examples of people who had really figured out how to do what you're suggesting, which is to garden these species we need in our homes to figure out when they're missing. And I was really struggling to find, you know, sort of complete um, solutions or even visions for complete solutions. And then I started talking to bakers and chefs, and especially uh, those that were working with fermented foods, and so like sourdough bread starters or kimchi. And when you look at those foods, those are foods that rely on microbes that colonize from the air, from our bodies, from the foods themselves to ferment. And then once they start to ferment, those microbes actually produce compounds that get rid of the bad species from that food. And so like in kimchi or sourdough, it's actually the acid from the microbes that allows those microbes to weed themselves. And, And we have extraordinary traditional knowledge about about those foods and how to do them in ways that are, you know, not just uh, healthy, but also tasty and smell great. And to me, what a great metaphor for what we're looking for. We want gardens in our daily lives that that weed themselves, that help to keep us healthy, um, and that build on our our microbes that are are in in our daily lives. Um, and, And the other thing that's so neat for me about the foods is that those are also embedded in our histories. And so, you know, how do we reconnect ourselves to the life around us, but also to our human stories? Um, And and so food's been really an invigorating way for me to think about the future of these microbes. And the other thing that's emerged is that we started studying the hands of some bakers to figure out, well, how many of the microbes that go into a kimchi or or a sourdough starter are actually coming from the baker's bodies? And so the the answer was quite a few. But then we, we, we accidentally discovered something else, which is that when you look at the hands of the bakers, they're actually covered in sourdough starter microbes. And so the daily work of the bakers has not only changed their garden, 
it's changed their own bodies. And, and so that made me start to think about uh, this broader story of what do we want from our lives. And, and your example of the, of the person going out to the park bench, what do we want our lives to say about us? And I think our microbes on our bodies and in our homes are kind of recording a story of our lives. And, and what I'd like my microbes to say is that, you know, I, I, live, I live a life with my hands in the dirt, with my hands in food, with, with my hands connected to history and biodiversity. Um, and I think we should all think about that. What do you want the microbes around you to say about how you've lived? Um, that, <laughs> I love that you're saying that, and it, it uh, gets very geeky, but um, that's one of my favorite places to be. Um, and, uh, you know, it, um, w- there's so much we don't understand. And, um, you know, w- w- it, it, because we talked about the space station, we're going into space and learning that. But I always think that there's this overlap between um you know space and the microbes and our you know our earth and just like how much we don't know and understand and how important it is to us as well um so i that's really interesting that the starter bacteria gets on their hands and probably changes their immune system and all sorts of other things i'm sure they're breathing it in yeah for sure i mean who i mean I, there are a bunch of studies i wish we would have done if we if we would have known that initially and we still have time we mm-hmm. can go back and do studies but but I, I had no idea even to expect that possibility. But some of the bakers, 60 to 80 percent of the microbes on their hands were lactobacillus bacteria, which are the starter bacteria, and the average person has like two percent. It's a totally different world. Mm. Ah, that's you, amazing. Um, so, is there something that that people can think about right now, um, while we don't know as much as we we want to about this, where they can um, change the biodiversity in their own home, so that um, you know they're not as affected with weak immune system or whatever? Uh, is there something that we know at this point? Yeah, um, there are some things that we know, and and. Um you know, so our first thing is to continue to do those simple things that we know get rid of the really dangerous top 50, those, those things we know are bad. So wash your hands with soap and water. Make sure that you have clean drinking water. Um, you know, work globally to help other people get clean drinking water that don't have it. Um, but, but then in your daily life, you know, open your windows. If, as long as the air outside your windows is not polluted, that seems to have benefit. And and it has other benefits, too, of connecting you to the sounds, to the smells around you. Um, get out and garden. Get your fingers in the dirt. Get outside in general. Uh, if you live in a really uh, isolated place, having a dog seems to have diverse benefits. Um, make fermented foods. And, and for me, these are all good suggestions because they're things that, that benefit us in other ways, as you've mentioned, and, and they seem to likely to also benefit us in terms of which species we're exposed to. But the other thing that people can do is they can get connected to the science of figuring these things out so we better understand them for the future. And so, for example, right now we have a project called Never Home Alone, like the book, on the iNaturalist platform. So if you go to iNaturalist, it's an app, you download it, and then you can take pictures of any species of animals you see in your house so you can help us figure out what's living there. And we already have kids around the world documenting species we didn't know were in homes. And so I think that's another way to, to be involved that, that both helps us make discoveries and maybe helps connect you to the spider in the corner, which might or might not be a new species. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that's really um, interesting. And I, I love that you have everybody just helping you out with that. And um, I find it amazing that you're still discovering new things about all of this as well. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, I mean, the, the great joy, I mean, if there are any families with kids listening, the great joy of science is that we'll be discovering su- super important basic things about the world around us, you know, 50, 100, 1,000 years from now if we're still around. But we're, we're still super ignorant. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so uh, to have a sense of wonder, of discovery, of the awesomeness uh, of the unknown, I think is a pretty good way to go about your days. 
Mm-hmm. Well, th- thank you so much for uh, the work that you're doing and to making us less afraid of the unknown and to know that most of these bacteria are our allies. I think that's really important for us to understand is, um, so that we can eventually stop trying to kill them all and, and um, you know, love them instead and, and grow them and have a healthier home. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's it's, um, it's wonderful that you do this program, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, well, well, thank you so much. Um, now, is there a, a website or any way people can, can find your book? Um, so, uh, well, what's the best way? So you can <laughs> just go to my lab website and see both the book and what we're doing in the lab. So robdonlab.com, and you'll see the book okay. and, and even more of the science. Okay, perfect. So um, just uh, so everybody remembers, the book is called Never Home Alone. And um, hopefully you're okay with the critters because they are all over the cover. Um, you got a picture <laughs> of all the bugs that you would find anywhere, um, which I, I enjoyed. But some people at work were like, I don't want to read that book. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> they, but uh, I kept telling them that it, it's a very fascinating read. And we did not um, touch on most of what's in there. So um, I recommend everybody pick this up. Um, So thank you, Rob, so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Have a great day. And I want to uh, thank everybody for listening. If you want more about my journey back to health, you can find that on my blog site at dr-risk.com. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn, or your favorite social media website. And uh, thank you so much for listening today. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.